very happy to have two visitors, um, Oscar Barea and Maria Rodriguez from both Harvard. And Oscar, unfortunately, will be running away tomorrow, so this is your chance to catch him, but Maria is staying through the week. And they're going to kick off their presentation with Oscar, who is going to tell us today about the holography of electric magnetic valley. Okay, thank you, Larian, uh, for the nice presentation, and thank you, Paul, um, for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, what I'll speak about today is work in collaboration with uh, Andrea Borghese, uh, who I was happy to find here today, and um, other people from uh, from the Netherlands, uh, Giuseppe De Vinesa, uh, uh, Adolfo Guarino, and Jesse Roost from Groningen. And I'll speak about a separate work with Javier Tarrio, who used to be a postdoc in Utrecht. Uh, work with, uh, that I did when I was based in, in, in UK. And behind this apparently uh, cryptic title, uh, what hides is uh, a supergravity development that has taken place over the last uh, year or so. <coughs> um, very specific to four dimensional supergravity. And in some sense, it's actually. Um, related to ATS-CFC, and that's the kind of flavor I want to give to this talk uh, today. So I'll start with a brief outline of why supergravity, and in particular gauged supergravity, is useful for holographic applications. Um, I've given this talk perhaps to a more uh, general audience before, and uh, this is a bit uh, of, a, of an overview, introductory, um, Material, but it's nevertheless, uh, I find it nice to, to place this, this thing in, in context. And the specific development that has taken place over the last few, few months and, or a year and a half or so is, is related to a family of new supergravities in uh, maximally dispersed symmetry supergravities in, in four dimensions whose degeneracy, whose, uh, in other words, the parameter labeling each member in the class uh, of the family is related to the breaking of electromagnetic duality in, in four dimensions. So that will be more explicit about this later. So what I'll do is introduce this family and then concentrate on a smaller sector of it, which is an n plus 2 sector of the full theory. I'll classify all vacua uh, with at least a uh, symmetry group uh, containing the full uh, gauge group, as a way. And then I'll discuss uh, domain wars between these ATS vacuum and these terminals of the ATS vacuum, and discuss domain wars uh, connecting these vacuum, which, if these supergravities turn out to, have, to actually have holographic applications, these domain wars will be related to uh, by holography to renormalization group flows between different conformal phases, superconformal phases of the dual state. Okay, so let me start with the a little bit of introduction, and we'll get to the gauge of gravity uh, shortly. But before that, let me record what happens when you place a stack of n uh, m two grains on top of a, of an eight dimensional metric cone of this form. Near the horizon, near close to the grains, the 11 dimensional geometry splits as, uh, as a prone looping background, AGS4 times M7, where M7 is the, is the base uh, of the cone whose apex the, the breaks are probing. And this geometry is supported by uh, four foot flops along the volume of the AGS. Now, for this solution, the internal space is Einstein with positive curvature. And in the specific case where this Einstein space is taken to be the round sphere, the solution is naturally super symmetric. The cone is just flat space. And, um, and the holography for this uh, brain configuration uh, has relatively recently been understood in terms of uh, the ABJ field. Uh, the ABJM field theory, the ABJM modal, 
which essentially is a three-dimensional John Simon theory, uh, a quiver theory, uh, with two gauge groups and the couplings related by just uh, being one the other and the other. And of course, this model has the uh, ingredients I want to highlight today of the usual ads um, or the usual ads model. In other words, the AJM Lagrangian is formal, and for some specific values of the coupling, I'm just not uh, enter into the details. This model is maximally symmetric and displays SOA global uh, global symmetry. These, like I say, are basic elements in ags -CFC because uh, this fulfills the holographic dictionary that global symmetries and features on one side correspond to particular local symmetries on the other side. The MJM model is dual to M theory on the program background. And the fact that it's maximally supersymmetric translates into the fact that this background is also maximally supersymmetric in, in M theory and displays SOA symmetry due to the isometry, the isometry of the, of the seven state. The, the picture you drew in the previous slide uh, would then be valid only for two brains, only two copies of the two brain, right? That, Not N, strictly, right? <laughs> strictly speaking, that that would be the case. But uh, it so happens that um, that uh, that for some features, large N is already in the two. So you, the supergravity limit is valid, even though uh, that's a little bit of a uh, of a weak point. Uh, in this correspondence, but that's that's quite right. Mm -hmm. Now, strictly speaking, this correspondence is only valid at a very specific point of the field theory, which is the conformal maximus specific <coughs> point. So the question therefore arises: Can we do better? Can we can we formulate um, can we formulate the correspondence? In more interesting, in more interesting ways, can we, can we, for example, describe more interesting field theory regimes and just like a, a specific uh, superconformal point? And we can, for example, you can you can perturb MGM field theory, and that corresponds on the field on the gravity side to perturbing M theory on this background. In general, for generic perturbations of the field theory living, living on the brains, that would correspond to full 11-dimensional quantum mechanical perturbations about this background. But it so happens that, as we all know, we have better control on this situation if we go to a particular specific limit in parameter uh, space, which is large n, with that particular caveat there. Um, and the large n limit in the field theory is as we all know, a classical limit, and therefore it corresponds in the gravity side to placing 11 dimensional supergravity, in other words, to uh, restricting this set of perturbations to classical perturbation about the classical 11 dimensional Brown-Rubin factor. But we can even have, even, and, and still, these perturbations at this level will still be 11 dimensional. Um, and we can gain even further control on the kind of perturbations that we can add. Of course, further control means we restrict ourselves to, 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 a, to a more constrained cl cl class of perturbations here. And the price we, you know, we we'll get we'll gain more control, but the, pr the price we pay is that we we lose in variety somehow, but you know, we, we can we can afford that. And we gain better control if, for example, we, re we require to work with operators to have, for example, closed under a brace product, in fact. And that translates on the, in the supergravity side, in the gravity, by having well defined, in a sense I'll come to in a second, four dimensional perturbations about this background. So forget about 11 dimensional perturbations, I'm considering now four dimensional perturbations about ATS4. Um, and this is the way we make contact with gauge supergravity in four dimensions. And in particular, with the with the fact that um, for this correspondence to to work uh, uh, to, to work properly, uh, the uh, the 
must exist and that should exist a truncation of 11 dimensional supergravity uh, on the internal space down to a certain four dimensional supergravity. The, the notion of perturbing the n equals h supergravity in the bulk, uh, do you mean by that really, <coughs> there's only one theory n equals h that you need? Do you mean to say that you perturb around different vacuum solutions? Uh, which is asymptotically ABS4, but nonetheless maybe, I don't know, uh, supersymmetry. Can you really maintain n equals h supersymmetry and still talk about perturbation? Yeah, yeah. You, you can? You definitely can. Yeah. But actually, right. perturbation may not be the, the best word because, let me come back to that. By truncation, what I mean by truncation is that, I made this point earlier, what the, the kind of fields that you want to keep in this setup are not fully fledged 11 dimensional, but somehow they just, you know, fields of perturbations, you let me use that word, about AGS4. Okay, why do you say anyway, sorry, I should yeah. ask the audience, no. why did you say there's only one theory? Do we know that there's a one parameter family of any Yeah, that's, that, I, that's that. Well, okay, that. I'll, I'll give you that, but uh, <laughs> that's it. Uh, that, no more. Ask me no more. Uh, that's it. Whereas the notion of perturbation is a very general notion. You can perturb in many different ways. I was pointing ways. out that you said there's only one. There isn't only one. It's okay. Family. It's that one. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want to make that point because I want to yeah. go back to that later. Okay. But indeed, um, you know, Chris already made the point that you know, the whole motivation of the talk is that there's a one premise family of any of the gravity. Okay. And uh, but indeed, I mean, where these, you know, the, these cases of gravity do live to a theory is a bit unclear at this stage, anyway. Yeah. There is certainly the old DeWitt Nikolai story does, uh, and that's the kind of kind of theory I'm referring to at this stage. Yeah. All right. Uh, that's truncation. Then consistent means that the four-dimensional, the, 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 the dynamics of the four-dimensional perturbations are given above ATS is is is, a, is compatible with that with that theory in a very precise way. And this is, by the way, why the word perturbation is perhaps a bit misleading, because consistent truncations are all about keeping, respecting the nonlinear details of the dynamics in a very precise way. It's not that I'm linearizing the theory and I'm, and I'm and I'm just keeping you know, small fluctuations, of perturbations at IGS4, is that I'm truncating the theory in a, in a consistent way with the classical equations of motion, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm able to fully probe uh, in a fully nonlinear way the full dynamics, even though it's, I'm just re restricting myself to a smaller, to a smaller sector of the, of, the, of the full set of things that I need. But now, these theories typically go by the name of uh, of gauge supergravities, and and these and these uh, feature here, the fact they are gauge, um, arise because these are typically truncations on non-trivial internal spaces. If the internal space was just flat, or we have <coughs> boxes associated to it, we'd be truncated to ungauged supergravity, and these are pretty trivial because. Because what makes them interesting in the first place is, is, the, is the gauging, and in order to get the gauging, uh, the internal spaces I'm truncating on must be must be non-trivial. In other words, must have curvature, must have G structures, or something. And these gaugings are just interactions that include non abelian gauge groups. Typically, that's what they usually call uh, gaugings. And crucially, uh, they generate a scale of tension for the. Uh, for the scale. This is the scale of potential that makes me that makes these these models in, 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 interesting from an ADS CFT point of view, especially of course if they have AGS vacuum. But people working in inflation and uh, in cosmological models and so on may want to use these models, but with for example just see that but I'm focusing myself, I'm focusing on more ADS uh, vacuum today. Okay, let me oh my god. What Run out of battery. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Do you have a power cord? Well, what do you have?
just me for it or something. They didn't fall asleep. They just fell asleep last week. Oh. Let me plug these anyway. Sorry. Dictionaries at work here 
because the gauge group of the of the silver gravity corresponds to the global symmetry of low level uh, temperature air, which is inherited from a from a truncation point of view. This gauge group is easily seen to be the isometry of the compactification surface. So, uh, when you say all possible mass deformations, pres pres preserving what? Uh, not necessarily preserving any supersymmetry, uh -huh. but if I take the fields that are present in the ABJM field model, in the ABJM field theory, uh -huh. these are essentially all quadratic terms. I see. All gauge invariant quadratic terms. All gauge invariant quadratic terms. Cool. Yeah. Now, these combinations, of course, you choose them appropriately, you may preserve n equals 1, you may break all the supersymmetry. But, you know, hold on. At least, you know, classically. Okay. okay. Mass terms of your safety go towards your safety. Yeah, that's a good question. Of course, uh, if I deform ABJM by mass terms or something, then the, the, the field theory would respond to that deformation by plunging into an RG flow, and it will flow into, into some other place. Do we know the and typically, that's, 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 also, that's also known for certain deformations. If you choose these, these parameters here appropriately, the, the infrared conformal phases are. Does that depend a lot on the details of the group and representation? For example, this xi, the index i could be a representation of not a simple group, but maybe yeah. g cross g prime. It, it, it could it. be by uh, fundamental or vector like. Uh, do you agree? Uh, uh, yeah, well, I've been mean, rather sloppy here in this notation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, but I, all, I, all I meant here is that, you know, you have typically all all possible quadratic all possible quadratic terms mm -hmm. for the fields of ABJM correspond to correspond to fields in the supergraph. That's simple. Okay. Um, these are old. Yeah. I just hit the wrong button. Nothing happened. Um, okay. Now we'll come to the. Uh, to, uh, to this one here, where you know I've spoken about the nice you know, gravity being, you know, <laughs> nice for gravity capturing uh, mass terms of OJM and so on. So, you know, the question arises: Is the SO engaging of any potential gravity unique? Now, the answer is yes, because we are so much biased towards this picture of HSCFC. Um, you know, any potential gravity in five dimensions is 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 unique. And then it was for young males is unique too. So, you know, the intuition is that okay, we have this super gravity here in four dimensions, ABJM in three, whole thing is unique. You see? Well, it turns out that uh, the answer is, is no, so otherwise I wouldn't be giving this talk today. And uh, and there is a one parameter family of SOA kitchens. And I'll discuss that those. Is there any, any further questions before I move on? How do we know that is unique? I mean, is there really? How do, I, how do we know that? Yeah, I mean, the proof. I mean, in the five dimensions is yeah. unique. Could there still be some? No, no, he means this one. No, the last one. I mean, once you find one generalization, you might prove it. In four dimensions, why can't I translate yeah. it into, into five? Let me answer that question. For example, I mean, is that what you asked? No, no, just uh, how, how rigorous is this proof of uniqueness now? The one oh, parameter. uniqueness. Oh. Is this 100%? No, that's a good point. I'm not sure about that. But um, <coughs> there is a there is some physical intuition of what's going on, and uh -huh. that's what I'll explain. At le there is at least a one parameter family. Okay. At least a one parameter family. May it, that may be the whole story. But if you I hand can't. it over to mathematicians, would they agree that there is a proof now? Or no, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. I don't know. But you know, the physics proof is that we're happy to buy this thing. I think yeah, but, it's fairly unique because this comes from embedding formalism, and uh, yes, but that's a very difficult you problem. You count the number of singlets in 912 representation of E7 with respect uh, to some subgroup, and you find this unique answer. No. Um, and the embedding formalism it yes. captures the most general possible gauging you can do. That's 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 right. That's right. But that depends. That's that's right. That's one point. That that depends mm -hmm. on the gauging too. So this may be this, that may be the case for the gauging. So you, you do count the splitting of the 912 E7 and the SOA, which is the gauge group. Right. Here. But as long as you change the, the gauge group, 
you know, that doesn't hold any. It's, as far as I know, well, I'll tell you the physics, you know, the physics story behind okay. it. But there may be more to it from a math point of view. All right. Do you know which parameters in the two CFT corresponds to the new parameters? In the ACFT? Uh, no, that's a question. Yeah, no. No. I, I do know, I do know. The original paper didn't consider that parameter should be home times. There's been some speculation about that too, yeah, and there's some good reasons to think that that would be the case. But as far as I know, and there's been no convincing proposal for what that parameter should be in the field there. Yeah. There's a, there's a, there is intuition of what that parameter corresponds to in the gravity, but not in the field. Cool. And that parameter in the gravity, in the, in the, in the four-dimensional of gravity, is related to electromagnetic duality break field. Yeah. So let me just go back to you know under gravity at EM and remind you that Maxwell's equations in vacuum are invariant under electromagnetic duality transformations. What that means is that if I swap F and star F in Maxwell's equations and the Bianca identity, and these two equations you know, get exchanged and nothing happens, the physics is invariant under that operation. So people usually refer to the situation as saying that all electromagnetic duality frames are equivalent. And what they mean is that there's a redundancy at the level of the future questions, and I can write a Maxwell Lagrangian corresponding to that, corresponding to these set of equations, where you know I've, I've made a choice on what is F and what is star F, but that, that is pretty arbitrary. And that's what that's what that's that's what this sentence reflects. Duality frame that I choose to, to, to write my Lagrangian from which this equation derives is a bit. That situation happens, that then changes though, when I turn on a source, because obviously if the Maxwell equation is sourced, then electromagnetic duality is broken. And what that means is that if I, if I change F, if I exchange F and star F, uh, those two equations don't, don't get interchanged, so that's pretty trivial. The physics now depends on the duality frame in the sense that prior to turning on my source, I need to freeze the electric duality frame. Yeah? So I freeze the electric, electromagnetic duality frame, I turn on my, my source, and then I can write a Lagrangian from which these equations derive. And the physics now depends in that sense on the duality. Simple as that. Um, okay, now this situation um, extends relatively straightforwardly to more complicated, um, or more complicated settings. For example, the abelian U U one to the n theory. There is a there are linear transformations I can make uh, between the field strengths and the joules now defined as the uh, derivatives of the group. Lagrangian with respect to the field strength. In this simple setting, that, that's just star f, but in more complicated settings, this is the, the, the proper definition. And if I do linear transformations at the level of the, of the Bianca identities and field equations, the whole thing gets, you know, uh, the whole thing gets uh, gets mixed up, but still, I'm still, you know, describing the same, the same set of field equations and, and Bianca identities. If I insist that the whole thing uh, after these linear transformations derives from a, from a Lagrangian like that, then I have to restrict my linear transformations to the synthetic. Uh, this, is a, this is a bit of a technicality I don't want to, to go into. Uh, I can even complicate further the theory, as in on gate supergravity. If I turn on non, non minimal couplings of scalar fields, this guy, in other words, I introduce scalars, and typically these are described by their own nonlinear sigma model. And I introduce non minimal complex other scalars to the gauge fields, like that. You have familiar with equals to, uh, I borrow the notation from there, so uh, familiar. 
And it so happens that the combined set of field equations and the anti identities, all the gauge fields, and now the, the scalars too, is invariant under, under duality transformations. Now the duality transformations get restricted from symplectic to the isometric group of this non linear sigma model. But this is a bit of a technicality again that I won't uh, enter into. But still, the message is that this, this model, which is the typically the kinetic the kinetic Lagrangian that features in non gates of gravity is, is invariant under some sort of electromagnetic duality transformation. This situation have, uh, changes again when I turn on gauging. So in other words, when I promote, when I charge the scalars under some of the gauge fields, I promote typically promoting the gauge fields into a non abelian gauge group, turning on charges, and in other words, changing. Um, promoting derivatives to, uh, to covariant derivatives, the usual way. T are usually the generators of <coughs> some gauge group. I'm gauging, that is a subgroup of the duality group. And it so happens that if I do this operation in supergravity, if I insist on preserving supersymmetry uh, in a nice way and so on, I need to turn on uh, terms of order G, which typically couple the uh, the fields to uh, the form unit of the boson receptor. And crucially, uh, an order g squared term, g is the gauge of the function here, <coughs> to the Lagrangian in order to restore the symmetry. But I can do this operation and stay uh, super. <coughs> the price I'm paying is that electromagnetic invariance is broken, just like in this simple setting. Um, because I'm turning on, I'm turning on sources uh, for the for the gauge fields. So the, the charge fields obviously source, uh, source the, the gauge fields and therefore electromagnetic duality is broken and the physics should depend on the synthetic. Well, I guess if you took magnetic molecules into account the molecules. If I took magnetic molecules. From the very beginning, very beginning if you took magnetic molecules in your equations, it would be broken. That is true, that is true. But I was considering here just a vacuum, a vacuum configuration with a Uno monopole. Yeah. Does that make sense? Why not? Well, it's by definition. You say I take a, when you take a J as a source, and you say I don't take a magnetic monopole. Just no, but I'm not taking J's. That's that's my original. Well, I think you took J in the car and you said that the electromagnetic field is broken, but it's broken that, because. Uh, that's that's right. Yeah. So even in this even in this situation, if I turn on J here, electromagnetic field is broken. Yeah. But I don't have any J here at this stage. So I was just, I was just, you know, writing this as an example. Have, yeah. yeah, yeah. Here I do have broken duality. I disputed that. And, I'm, and I'm, what I'm saying is that, and I'm just illustrating this, this J with a specific example in Silver Yeah. That, that was the, uh, the only. But indeed, as long as you have a J, wherever it comes from, you do you do break the oh, um, But I want to illustrate these points with uh, <coughs> uh, before doing that. Um, now, you know this is the usual prescription. You know, uh, turning on derivatives into covariant derivatives. But there's a little there's a little point here too. Which is that the the gauge well, the, the invariance group is an invariance group at the level of the field equation, yeah. not a, not necessarily at the level of the Lagrangian. So, invariance group, and even in this restricted setting, uh, which is the invariance of the isometric group of the of the non-linear uh, model, needs to be as a group of the combined set of equations of motion and the yeah. And this obviously prompts the, this question, can magnetic charges be turned on? In other words, charges with respect of the fields, of the, of the gauge fields that enter the set of the quantum and magnetics, but not the Lagrangian. Yeah? Can this be turned on in this context? I'm focusing on this gauge around the context. And the answer, oh, oh. 
And the answer is yes, provided, uh, provided some precautions are taken. Take that magnetically charged scalars has had to appear in the action to realize into tensors. And that is a familiar situation uh, from flux compatibilizations on calabrias, for example. The Roman mass in particular arises as the, as the charge of the uh, dualized action. If you dualize the, if you dualize the B field uh, of type 2 A into a scalar in a massive type 2 A reduction, what, what you'll see is that that dualized scalar has picked up a charge controlled by the Roman's mass with respect to one of the vectors. So, you know, we are used to this kind of situation. And uh, I, was, I just wanted to say that, it, that, that there is a way where, uh, where these magnetic charges can be, can be turned on in a fully dually covariant way. Uh, and that um, this is a very intensive method of accomplishing which is very important for the kind of for all these kind of constructions. Um, okay, now I do want to illustrate this with any possessive of gravity. We are at the unplex level, this is the field content. And uh, the duality group in that case is E7, which is a subgroup. E7 is the uh, isometry of the nonlinear sigma model of the of the of this particular model, and that is contained in SP56. And the scalar parameterized this ghost set, and you have the field function here. And it's, uh, it's very well known that this, this model arises by, uh, by reduction of 11 dimensional supergravity on the seven of the seven problems. Now, um, the the Witt Nikolai story, the Witt Nikolai supergravity I started with, is a is a gauging of this model where uh, where they set on the fact essentially and, uh, and, and they introduce minimal couplings with respect to, to the gauge fields this way, what I just showed you. Introduce the relevant couplings and uh, scalar function and the scalar function, and therefore they found uh, the the SOA gauging of, of maximum supergraphs. But you know, I've been speaking about these you know, story of turning on charges with respect to magnetic vectors and so on. The question seems to be obvious. Can you do this by turning on uh, magnetic charges? And <coughs> well, it turns out that you can because these people, these people did precisely that and found this one comes family of SOA gauge where the parameter only that is an angle that measures the combination, the linear combination of electric and magnetic gauge fields in the adjoint of the gauge group that are gauging SOAs. I won't mention this mechanism here, but what I say is that obviously when you turn off the magnetic coupling, you go back to the, to the old arithmetic story, and now distinct theories, different theories arise for different values of the gauge group. Now the previous discussion, or that you are convinced by the previous discussion, that the physics should depend on the synthetic right now, and therefore the physics should depend on the parameter order. So I'll devote the rest of the talk to convince you that that is the case. But before we move on, are there any further questions on, on this? So is it now settled that uh, everybody in that interval is distinct? That is settled. And now this interval is kind of it's kind of strange because you'd expect them to to run to only you'd expect only that to run from zero to the bar, yeah. And it so happens that the two bar doing activity is random, and uh, it so happens that from pi on a to two pi, those are related by field redefinitions to to bars to, to theories in this in this range. But other than that, it's settled that these are these are these are different. Uh, Can you explain why U1 is uh, not inside E7, but rather outside? Uh, Can I explain? U1 belongs to the coset, as you've written, SP56 over E7. It must. But in principle, it could have arisen, uh, it could be one of the E7 generators, right? U1. So, so why does it have to be... So you won't have this no, you, you, you won't. Why not, is my question. Well, you wouldn't because 
if it was, uh, that would be related to a federal definition. Ah. Because E7 is the, is the duality group. It has to be outside the E7 duality group of the theory, because otherwise I, I could redefine it. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it doesn't, there are situations where I can. So for omegas, on pi on it, between pi on it and two pi, it turns out that I can. For, okay. no, for, for, for no good reason. Oh. For no good reason. But certainly, if I took my omega, at least this is you know, straightforward, because omega is an angle. The, perhaps the, you know, the, 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 the not straight, the, 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 the non trivial statement is the statement here. But what I'm trying to say is that if I take omega to be to, to, to lie here, then it's going to be straightforwardly. But isn't that the really, scalar could, potential? I can really find it straightforward. Okay. The scalar potential is not invalid in the E7, right? So why? The scalar potential. You come out to get. Uh, the scalar potential is, is invariant under E7. No. Scalar potential the scalar is, a, is a scalar. So it's not. In a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a trivial representation of E7. So it's. Hold on, hold on. The scalar potential I saw the invasive graph is invariant under SOA, not the E7. Oh, hold on a second. That's right. Um, um, By construction, it's a so yeah. invariant no, function. It's SOA invariant. There's a notion of invariance. You can transform the scalar and see what rotations will leave the potential invariant. And uh, that's, I think, is right. The so way. So now we I need think that to, it um, should. I think it's. Uh, it, I, I think it, sh it should be invariant at fully seven. Um. um not the superpotential. Uh, not the scalar potential. Yeah. I mean, the ungay supergravity is invalid. Uh, well, you scalar. don't have a, a potential. Right, but not uh, the scalar potential breaks down the uh, duality group. Um, I think it's written in E7. Seven. You well, use E7 you can, coset representative. Yeah, That's true, yeah. but that doesn't mean it's E7 invariant. You use the T tensors. T tensors are objects in which you act with a SOA generator on E7 over S8 coset representative. Because of that, <coughs> you're rotating with a SOA generator, you see. That's why, and you sandwich it with another function from the left, you get this um, so-called T-tensor. Yeah, and those their square is a potential. And I think those are only SOA invariant. And if true, then the, my earlier question yeah, uh, begs for a better explanation. Yeah, I'm, 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 Confused now. Yeah. Uh, I would say that the. I would say <coughs> that you could, you could write, the potential out of E seven numeric quantities, but I'm, I'm getting confused at this point. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's sufficient for your answer that the kinetic term for the vector field transform has that property, and I think there, E seven well, is I mean, okay. Something happened here today. Yeah, um, let me move on okay. and and uh, and uh, I hope that it becomes clear that there is a that certainly a dependence of this angle certainly arises in the in the scalar potential, and then we have we have a dependence of this angle on the on all relevant physical quantities, and, and I'll, I'll just focus on the vacuum structure and so and of course other elements too. Okay, so but I, I won't do that in the full theory, but rather I'll restrict myself to a smaller sector, which is the SU3 sector. Um, but first of all, it's stable, which is that you know, even if these guys don't have an M-theory lift, they always define an N equals infinity field. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a tricky question. Um, good. So, if I restrict myself to this particular sector, in other words, if I truncate everything to SU3 to the SU3 single sector, I get an ethical system of gravity with one vector and one hyper with this uh, with, with, with this <coughs> model. Um, I won't enter into the details, but um, it's a known result by Warner that the uh, vacuum structure of the Dewey Nikolai theory with at least SU3 symmetry contains just three points. Uh, of these symmetries here. And what we find with uh, Drea is that if you turn on uh, parameter omega, omega, to, omega shows up in the, in the potential, and then new points arise. What typically happens is that 
the now I am. <laughs> okay. What typically happens is that the um, it means I can't. I can't plug in the battery and the uh, and the screen at the same time because the the, the shapes are incompatible. <laughs> what typically happens is that we find we find uh, new points and the the cosmological constants vary with omega, a function of, of omega. But there's an old kind of new point with a symmetry that wasn't present in the old story, and we can see the symmetry which is new to. And um, also what happens is that the cosmological constant uh, varies, but the location, the location of the critical points in the, in the, uh, in the moduli space does vary too. Now these, well, what these pictures are, these are obviously the complex way, but um, if you recall, the n equals 2 supergravity I'm talking about is coupled to a vector and a hyper. That means that there are six scalars in this model. And I can choose a gauge where the potential depends on only four, which are two complex, two complex, two complex scalars. And these are the two complex planes. See, the scalars are restricted to, to line the Poincaré disk. These are the two Poincaré disks. <coughs> on this one, which is the vector multiple uh, scale. So what happens at omega is zero, the usual, the, the, the old story is that I have a, a unique point with n equals two supersymmetry, and as you see, you want symmetry here. This point is unique. I can think of another, uh, having another one like at infinity, like the boundary of the disk here is infinity. And if I turn on omega, it so happens that these guys start moving a little bit, and there's another one which shows up, there's another point, which comes into the plane. So at generic points, I have two points, unlike the omega zero situation where I have only one point and then it was Now at five and four, if I remember correctly, this guy goes all the way up to infinity again, and I go back to the, to the original situation where I only have one and it was two. There are, you know, the same situation arises for, for other points with due to symmetry. This new SC3 point is quite interesting too because at omega is zero, I have no point whatsoever. This guy dies at infinity. When omega is turned on, this guy starts moving in, so I have one point, and at omega is five and four, this guy, is, this guy disappears again and it goes all the way up to infinity. So rounds just mean they just depend on omega. There is no RG flow or anything. No, here. these are critical points. I'll go yeah. to the RG flows next. Time. They just their positions in the uh, yeah. in the scalar manifold. Moves with them. Uh, now, they, this is a bit of a weak argument of why you know these should be new points and so on because I mean they, these omega dependents might be I think that it could be redefined or it could be redefined away or it could be somehow uh, removed. But what we find is that there is a new point. Let me rephrase. Oh, uh, the the scale the spectrum the scalar spectrum at this point usually doesn't depend on omega even though the points move in the scalar manifold the masses of the fields uh, about these critical points is omega independent which is kind of fishy it is that to be new point because you know the scalar masses are you know like a fingerprints of a of a model not just scalars all masses all masses all, all masses are omega independent mm -hmm. now. We do find a point in this sector, which is not super symmetric, and which says SU3 symmetry, whose masses do run with omega. So this is the definite proof that these indeed are different supergravities, super different theories, because, it, because, because the, the physical spectra are, uh, is sensitive uh, to the deforming parameter. OK. Uh, so, so what's the explanation for the, the other case then, uh, supersymmetric case? Why is it that the, the, the mass do not depend on omega? Is there uh, not some way of seeing There is this? no deep reason why not, mm -hmm. um, but it so happens. I mean, so the omega dependence is such that it cancels out from the, uh, mm -hmm. from the, from the mass spectrum. When you, 
the normalized spectrum. Yeah. So no, it's not the masses about the, the quantum. You have to. What I'm doing is this technique with respect to the radius H, the radius radius, radius radii. So these these quantities, the mass, the mass, the mass times the A L, the radius radius squared is the omega radius. Did you yes, check so this for n equals one? Is there an n equals one version of this story? Yes, these yeah. points are. In other words, you started the n equals two model you gave us, but are there points in the moduli space where n equals two breaks down to n is one? N equals two break. Yeah, these points are. These, these oh, you have it there. Yeah. I see. These so there too, the masses do not depend on omega. No, they don't. No. I see. So it's no. regardless of amount of Susie. It's just any Susie. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. The point I showed is that it's, it's non super symmetric. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's not super symmetric. Good. But like I said, these are points in, these are points, these are critical points on the scalar potential when I vary omega. Now, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do now is to construct domain walls and see how picture of, of, of our G flows changes when I when I switch on uh, that parameter. Uh, and for that what I do is to construct domain walls in these gravities that interpolate in the different critical points that I have in these models. And I write down the flow equations and what is nice about this particular N equals two model is that even though it doesn't have to uh, a super potential Exists, uh, which makes life easier for you. So you can you can you can integrate the flow equation into just DPS first of the equation. So in other words, I mean I could always do the supersymmetry variation. So that's essentially what I'll do. I'm focusing on supersymmetric flows between supersymmetric ADS. Okay, so let's keep that. Let me uh, let me show you what the picture is. This is, this is again the, the complex plane, the, the vector multiple complex plane, the hyper multiple complex plane. I'll focus on this one. What we have in the center is the uh, SOA point, which stays there at all omega. This is the omega is zero situation. Here we have the n equals two point, and here we have the g2 point. This point is doubled here because I use a bit of a lousy parameterization, which is nevertheless convenient. Uh, but, it's, but this point is, is this point and this point is the same. It's physically the same. They have the same cosmological constant. They have the same masses. It's the same. It's just an artifact of our parameterization. Actually, the picture is symmetric above these axes. Yeah. Same so mass means in terms of uh, cosmic constant and number is unchanged. Yeah. Because cosmic constant is still no, it's, it's the same. No, it's, it's, these two are the same. This is a minor point I'm making. These two points is just a matter of an artifact of my parameterization. They just the same, physically the same point. In other words, in the dual field theory, they correspond to the same conformal case of the chain. Yeah. And okay. So this is the old Warner story, and <coughs> and now uh, this is the picture of flows that arise in this case, and this has been studied, you know, right after. ABJM and people uh, back in the 90s also uh, worked this out. <coughs> what we have is that we have direct flows from the SOA point in the UV. I'm using an analogy flow that's in here. Uh, in other words, the, this, this guy is always at, at the top of a hill, and these guys are down the hill. And there, is a, there are direct flows from the central point, n equals a point, to the n equals two point, to the n equals one point. Recall that this, this flow is the same as this flow, and this parameterization. And there are flows from the g2 point to the n equals two point, which are direct. So these are steeper tested on the uh, super potential, on the super potential, yeah, on the scale potential. There are also flows that run all the way to infinity and go to go to the boundary of the concrete uh, is in this parameterization. These are the direct flows. And what Bilch and Warner and collaborators realize is that actually the, 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 the picture is richer in the sense that this point here, the n equals 2 point, is the, 
is a basin of, of attraction of flows that, are, that start at the n equals 2 point and end up at the n equals 2, uh, sorry, start at the n equals 8 point, end up at the n equals 2 point, but not only go directly, this flow is unique, but go in you know, a continuous set of trajectories linking the, these two points and go as close as possible to the teacher point without ever returning. This picture is again symmetric about the, the real axis, and uh, and this cone of flows, as these guys uh, call this, uh, is bounded, as you see, by a direct flow and flows that go uh, through the digital point, or in other words, actually more precisely, flows that end or start. At the but this this picture, there's nothing new. This picture, which isn't contained in this picture. And if I if I go in the tilted direction, this is uh, uh, deformation breaks me to n equals one explicitly. Then I These go are back to n equals two. That's it. <coughs> yes, cool. that's that's right. This that's yeah. the point. This direct flow is n equals two. Yeah. But a generic flow here is n equals one. That's right. So here, what I've depicted is the, the boundaries of the cone. Let's not draw flows here or like which are. And in all these cases, the CFT story is well known, right? And in all these cases, the CFT story is well known in terms of AVJL, and, 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 the, and the infrared point is also well known, and has been discussed by Clayman and Clark. Are they, um, uh, do, do these flows occur through the mass deformations you referred to earlier? Or? That is, that, that's All of these flows here, yeah. okay. So if you tweak those parameters appropriately, mm -hmm. then you get these plots, or you get these ones, or you get the G2 plot. Okay, so what, what, um, what I did then is to, to see what happens when you turn an omega. And when you turn an omega, something interesting happens. For example, you start by turning on omega very mildly, a small thing. And there are two things that happen here. This is the most visual thing. I'll go to that later. First thing is, this point starts moving a little bit up. And as a consequence, at end, these, these two points now are different. These two develop different cosmological constants. They're the same spectrum though but different cosmological concepts. This means that if there is finite field theory dual to these points, these are different conformal phases. They're not the same conformal phase anymore. As a consequence, these cone of flows, I still have a cone of flows here, but the picture is not symmetric about the, same, about the, uh, the real axis. And the situation is that it's, it's then much, much richer, and the omega is zero, because all this cone here is filled by n equals one flows that flow from the central SOA point to the n equals two point uh, in, a, in an n equals one manner. But the whole thing is filled with flows. Of course, the most dramatic situation happens here in this part of the, of the diagram where <coughs> the, S, the new SU3 point, the new SU2 point, and the new n equals two SU3 to one point are pulled in from all the way from infinity uh, into the physical into the physical moduli space. And these capture, these are endpoints of new flows that come from uh, from the central point. So in other words, what used to be a direct flow to infinity now gets separated into three different behaviors. And that's what we have. Now, that is the situation at generic omega between 0 and 5 and 8. And at 5 and 8, something special happens again. 5 and 8 is the other end, the, the, the rightmost end of the interval. And what happens is that the picture is again symmetric, but now about this diagonal. This point here and these, these two points have again the same cosmological constant. And are the same uh, in all respects. And this is kind of interesting because these two points used to be 
equivalent used to be the same at omega root zero, but they started moving uh, uh, as, as soon as omega was turned on, and as soon as, as omega was turned on, they became unrelated, they became uh, independent points. This point was new too, and all three were independent, and at, um, at omega is pi on eight, what happens is that these two remain independent, but this one became become equivalent by this Z2 transformation. Yeah, yeah. This is not, I'm not making this up. What happens is that they have the same cosmological constant. That's why, I, that's why I'm emphasizing this point. Yeah. In this case, do you know CFT2? No. <laughs> but we do know that if there is a CFT tool, this is very informative because it has to be such that there are two different conformal phases with G2, uh, the G2 global symmetry, and with free, uh, and with free um, uh, with, with free energies that we can read off from the uh, from the cosmological constant of this guy. So, you know, we are thinking if, if field theory exists at finite end, of course, uh, I'll already made a disclaimer that these are these field theories always exist at, at, at n is infinity. But if these two field theories exist at finite end, then we are pinning we are pinning certain features down. Um, but from 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 this description, <coughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, this is the this is the uh, this is the final picture. So as you can see, this as I'm saying, these points are unrelated. These are different points, even though they have the same G two symmetry. But this cone here, from equals A to S L two to S L three one, is all filled up with cones with uh, with flows that flow from here to here in a uh, n yeah, equals one manner, but this this set of flows here is equivalent to this one because you know it gets mapped into one another by this Z2 transformation. Uh, but notice that the situation is different from the omega root zero case because in that case the cone of flows was bounded between the direct flow and flows that approach the G2 point. And here the the, the boundary is different. The boundary of G2 G2 point of flows. So that's another that's another feature which is different from ABJM, or will be different from ABJM and will be predicting about two field theory. Here, however, in this new SU3 point, the picture is very similar to the previous case, to the omega root zero case, in the sense that the flows of the cone of flows is limited, is bounded by flows that approach very, very, very closely the G2 point and the direct flow, which I haven't pictured here, which goes about Goes up on, on, over the diagonal. Yeah. Okay, I'm over time now, so let me wrap up. Uh, okay. So, what I've shown you today has been um, spoken a bit about a new family of SLH supergravities with vacuum supersymmetry. And I've charted the vacuum structure that this has to symmetry for these theories and constructed some uh, domain rules. Now, some questions have already been asked in the talk, and, and these are you know, the interesting questions. Do, do these field theories have a theory of lift? And consequently, are the field theories, the dual field theories, do the, field, the, the, the dual field theories uh, can the, field, the dual field theories be extrapolated into, into finite energy? And, and these are the uh, and these are the questions that we'd like to uh, address in the near future. But um, by itself, I think that this is a quite remarkable development because uh, because you know I mean the the old SOA case for gravity state has been known for. 30 years, and these guys have just been uh, unnoticed for so long. And uh, by themselves, they are quite the normal. Uh, or are by themselves. Uh, so, that's all. Uh, thank you very much. And if you have further questions, I'll be happy to thank you. Thank you. Do you have anything to say about the Antony Do I? Do, have I decided about No, do you have anything to say? Do I? 
Uh, well, these guys have, um, and you know, they try and run the the program of of trying to build a, a consistent collection of client assets by the reformulation of them in time theory in terms of SU8 covariant quantities, and so SU8 being the the R symmetry of any mosaic You know, they beam down the sort of structures that should arise in the construction, but uh, no, no, no definite answer was given. Um, I don't know, the question is open. Presumably, intuitively, it would require get engaged fields from some sort of dualized version, double forward. I mean, that's, I've heard this train speculated. I presume that's, that's yeah, more, I mean, it's inevitably going to be behind, evolved, is that right? Because I guess people are thinking in those terms yeah. too, yes. That would be the. Uh, well, on the other hand, you know that this is our parameter. Um, This is a parameter that should live somewhere. And, and we know that 11 dimensional supergravity is quite rigid in that it doesn't admit you know, these kind of deformations. So there's some tension. Uh, some tension there. If you linearize the field equations of uh, this n equals a theory, supergravity, uh, do you see the parameter in, uh, already at the linearized field equation? Uh, uh, Let's say fermion or scalars or whatever. Yeah, uh, I guess I guess you should. I guess you should because the spectrum I showed, mm -hmm. uh, well, the spectra I showed is omega dependent. So you definitely should. Um, if it wasn't, I wouldn't be sure. But it certainly. But it, it would appear that, that you, linearized order. if they do appear there, then it would seem that you are using 56 gauge fields, but we know that only 28 of them are independent. No, but hold on. Uh, how would that oh. work? Uh, let's see. No. Oh. Yeah, oh. That's, well, that would be independent on the frame I'm using. I'm definitely using an electric frame always. So I'm rotating everything to an electric frame secretly. But I don't have more gauge fields and the 28 that gauge has a weight. Yeah, but if you look at the linearized equation, let's say you look at the uh, fermions, let's say. In the covariant derivative, are you going to have 28 vector fields or uh, the yes. 56? Yes, 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 yes. I, ha I, I do have the 56 of them. However, not all of them propagate. See, that's what's bothering you. Yes, that's what's bothering me. So you would use them there. But the field young Mills field equation, the linearized young Mills equation, will only describe 28 of the, oh, may I, please? 28 that is, that, exactly. That, that, the linear, the, the young Mills equations would, would only describe 28, 28 propagating vectors. So I will only see box A equals zero in Lorentz case, say, for 28 vectors. I'm not going to see a tilde anywhere. Yeah, box A tilde should not arise, right? I mean, the, correct? I see that the uh, or, or you wouldn't have independent get you wouldn't you wouldn't have in a point independent equations of motion or eight yeah. Yeah. You wouldn't have independent equations of motion. Yeah. But the only dependent shouldn't drop out. Okay. Okay, thank you. Even at the linear rights level. Other Thank you.